Hello, and welcome to the webcast. This is the first session of our virtual 2021 Building Opportunity Conference, providing insight for companies operating in the built world. Over the span of this conference, we will cover topics including economic updates, real estate industry outlooks, and trends around ESG and technology and innovation. More information around our conference and sessions, including registration, are available in the links provided in your resources widget here on ON24, as well as on mossadams.com. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Today, we have our keynote session, the 2030 Opportunity, featuring Nikki Greenberg. And now, I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, Elaine Irvin. Elaine is the National Practice Leader of the Construction, Real Estate, Hospitality, and Professional Services Group here at Moss Adams. Elaine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gerald, and welcome to everyone. You know, I'm really excited today to have Nikki Greenberg here with us. Um, she's going to help us envision the 2030 opportunity. To give you a little background on Nikki, she's an innovation strategist and a thought leader. She helps the real estate industry to reimagine their spaces and bring them into alignment with the increasingly digitized way that people live, work, and communicate today. She is the founder of both Real Estate of the Future and Women in Prop Tech, and she leads the Technology and Innovation Council for ULI in New York City. Nikki entered the industry through her career as an architect and a real estate developer for transformative, multi-award winning, mixed-use residential and retail developments. She's a frequent speaker at leading global conferences, commentator in the press, and recipient of numerous industry awards, including being recognized as top 25 commercial real estate innovator in 2021. Congratulations, Nikki. So please join me in welcoming Nikki Greenberg for her presentation today. Good morning, or hello, Nikki. <laughs> hello, I was gonna hello, say good hello, morning hello. because it is morning for you. <laughs> 
I know that was very, very polite of you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to hear about the 2030 opportunity. Um, as mentioned, it, I am being a little bit sneaky. I know my bio says that I'm in New York City, but in today's age, you can actually be anywhere at any time. So when I talk about the future, I talk about it with, um, with a sense of realism, because for me, it's already tomorrow. So just get your head around that. So today I am talking about the 2030 opportunity. It's going to be a pretty interesting and exciting presentation. Uh, it's probably a little bit different to some of the presentations that you've um, had for your continuing professional education. However, there'll be some facts in there. There'll be a lot of fiction. There might even be a little bit of science fiction in there. But the purpose of this talk really is to get you thinking and excited about what the future holds. So. Enjoy, enjoy the ride. So, you know, by way of introduction, you know, I've already been introduced. And, you know, I, I have a cheek to call myself a futurist. And one of the reasons that I'm able to do that is that, you know, everybody in the construction industry, I believe, should be doing the same. Because what we're actually doing when we're in design and construction and development is that we actually have to project the way that communities are going to be used into the future. You, know, you can see me standing on stage over here with a couple of developments that I worked on. And this is what we're doing. We have to think about when we're designing a place, what are the, you know, what are the future uses that are going to come? What do the people in the future using this space need? And how can we actually be positioning our developments to be future ready? And especially in these times when things are changing so rapidly and technology is evolving at the fastest rate that it ever has, it becomes even more important for us as real estate and construction professionals to be thinking in quite an innovative way. So I love showing these slides just as a reminder, you know, New York City, you know, 2019, the, the New York of the movies, you know, the buzz and taxis driving everywhere filled with people. And then you flick over to 2020. This is a photo that I took in the West Village looking down towards the, um, the World Trade Center. And you can just see how rapidly things changed. And wherever you are in the world, you probably saw a very similar scene. And that is to say that change can happen in an instant, and it does. But what we find ourselves in now is that I like to use the analogy of a construction site without blueprints, because the world as we know it has been completely ripped apart and demolished without warning. But what we have to do now is that we actually have to guide the way that we're going to build back because there is, no, there is no blueprint, there is no guide of what we need to be doing next, but we actually have the opportunity to invent it and to create the future that we want to see, which I think is an incredible and um, powerful time for all of us in the industry. I also like to show these slides because it's a reminder that the future is now. You now on the left-hand side, you can see this beautiful development in Singapore, you know, with this incredible, you know, these incredible structures. And on the right, you can see a humanoid robot. And the technology is there. The technology has been around for a while and it's advancing at such a rapid rate. And it's really up to us to think about to what extent we want to adopt it and bring it into our projects. So just some good news about this presentation. This is actually a post-COVID, non-COVID talk. So you'll be seeing that I'm going to be talking more about what's happening well into the future and not talking about what's just happening, you know, today or in the next six months. And the other thing is that we're actually on track for a very exciting future. You know, our industry has grown leaps and bounds. There's so much that's been happening in the innovation space and the adoption of technology. And just the, um, the change that I've definitely seen, and I'm sure you've seen in the past 18 months around understanding that it's not business as usual in our industry, that it's really positioning us in, a, in an incredibly exciting way. Now, this is a great quote that came from McKinsey, and I apologize that I haven't recorded the name of the report, but it says, to survive the digital age, real estate needs to reinvent itself. And I think it's quite a powerful quote because really what it's saying is that we can't actually just progress, you know, one step in front of the other in quite a, what we consider a linear and logical progression, but we actually have to take a step back and think about, well, what does this industry need from us? You know, how can we actually survive in this age today, but also the increasingly digitized age that's coming? 
So it actually takes a complete rethink. And um, again, you know, there's plenty of opportunity for innovation and different ways of, of going about it, which, um, you know, which I'll present to you through this presentation. So this is a section that I, I think I put in for myself. Um, you know, I just think it's something that I found very exciting when, you know, to, um, you know, when, when I read a certain book and just in terms of the way that we operate um, as human beings in, in this climate. So there's a fantastic book, which I highly recommend. So, you know, jot it down on a piece of paper or on your keyboard, on your notes, however you like to take your notes. And it's called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And these are some, um, some notable excerpts from the book. So firstly, today there is more change in one year than our grandparents experienced in a lifetime. I mean, this is something that's just incredibly profound. You know, just the rate of change that's happening because of technology is incredible and it's unprecedented. So if you're finding it difficult to keep up with the latest trends and every day you're seeing something new in the news that's emerging, you know, be it, you know, be it blockchain, be it AI, be it machine learning or whatever it is, and you're feeling a little bit confused about, you know, what is this? Like, why is, why is all this stuff being thrown at me? Well, it is, you know, there's a lot of change that's happening. And in addition to that, today's also global and exponential. So what we're seeing, especially with technology such as, you know, Zoom and with, you know, with the internet, that we're not actually, um, we're not actually situated in one location anymore. We're actually able to connect with people and intelligence from all around the world. So what this means is that, and we've seen it definitely in the innovation world, even with the, um, the creation of the COVID vaccine, is that you can have scientists and innovators all around the world working on solving different problems or different elements of a problem and then being able to come together to create a solution rather than having one team in one place try and progress at a linear pace. So what we're seeing is just an explosion of innovation that's happening all across the world and all these technologies and innovations are available to us no matter where we are. However, at the same time, our brains, you know, our, our monkey brains, They've evolved as local and linear. So, you know, we're used to living in one location and doing things step by step and seeing progress happening in a linear fashion. So for us, being able to grasp the extent of innovation and technology and this global and exponential landscape, this is something that's quite new to us and something that we're not used to as human beings. So I'm gonna hand over just for our first poll question while you, while you ponder that. Thank you, Nikki. So here's our first polling question. What industry do you represent? I'll give you a few moments to respond, everybody. To respond, please click the button to the answer you choose and hit the submit button that appears. If you cannot see the submit button, please enlarge the slide area in your window. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the for polling questions. And I see some uh, uh, responses coming in the Q&A uh, box here. Remember, you'll want to click on the slide itself. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Very good. It looks like most of the audience has sent in their answers. So let's look at the results. All right, and here they are. Nikki, back over to you. Right, thank you. Um, I'm disappointed to see that architects aren't very well represented here. Hopefully there's a few architects that have moved to other sectors of the industry like myself. So let's talk about innovation versus disruption and you know what I mean when I talk about innovation or disruption. So innovation is a new product uh, method or idea First, disruption is a radical change to an existing industry or market due to techno technological innovation. So let me give you an example from, you know, from our industry. So an example of innovation, you know, most of us on this call is probably used to seeing drawings coming from a drawing board, you know, hand drafted. However, that then moved to being drafted by, you know, on a computer in two dimensions and efficiencies came through that. You didn't, you could share documents, you could erase things and change things quite quickly. So it became more efficient and you could also have multiple people working on one file. 
That then moved into 3D CAD. So rather than having a 2D drawing, it became 3D. And it's something you could turn around, could become smarter. You could have visualizations, which was, you know, a progression. From that became BIM, where you could then have smart models that are laden with a lot of information. And then from that, these smart models have now moved into digital twins. So you're taking your, um, your, um, your 3D models, your BIM models, from the um, construction and engineering drawing stage into the operations of a building. So this is an example of innovation where it's gradual progression. However, when we talk about disruption, what we're talking about is a move from, you know, an early stage to that late stage with nothing in between. And that's actually something we're experiencing in the real estate industry because we've been a little bit slow to progress and embrace a lot of technology compared to other industries, say, you know, say online shopping or or, um, you know, or even the banking industry being able to do everything on apps, we're actually going through a disruption because we've needed to skip a few steps and get to this end point of where we need to be. So this is a great quote, disruption only happens to the unprepared. So the good news is I'm making sure that you're gonna be prepared for what's coming in the future. And especially when we think about where we are today, it's been described as a black swan event. So many of you may um, know the term black swan. Um, it's used in Nassim Talbot's uh, book by that same name. And essentially it comes from this anecdote where once upon a time in the world, when people thought of a swan, they always thought that it was white. And then one day explorers came to Australia where I am and they saw that there's a black swan and they were completely surprised. And this just completely made them rethink the notion of swans and what swans should be. And again, the good news is uh, as an Australian, we always knew that black swans existed. So you can trust me when I give you my advice over here about some of these things that are happening um, in the industry that we might see coming. I will take a moment now, of course, to give my disclaimer. Um, you know, what comes to follow, you know, please don't base any investment decisions upon it. These are my own opinions. Um, do your own independent research. Really the purpose of this um, presentation is to inspire you to think about some of the trends and technologies that are coming and to see what the possibilities are that are opened up by it. So I'm gonna run through a number of mega trends and talk about how they're affecting the industry. So in terms of a mega trend, what I'm talking about here is an important shift in the progress of society of a particular field or activity or any major movement. So I'm talking about some of the major movements. But before I get started, I might hand over to our next polling question uh, just to help us set the scene. Thank you, Nikki. And here is our second polling question. What generation do you represent? Also, I'd like to take this time to remind everybody to submit your questions for the presenter in the Q&A window. I've seen a couple come in. We do have quite a bit of content to cover today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. So again, uh, let's uh, have everyone submit their responses to the polling question here. We see quite a number of them falling in. Remember, after you make your selection, hit the submit button. And if you don't see the submit button after making your selection, enlarge your slide window. Just a few more seconds. And there we go. Most of everyone's locked in. Let's look at the results. And Nikki, back over to you. Oh. All right, so we've got a lot of millennials, some um, are then going to Gen X and baby boomers. All right, and we've got not many, not many alphas and not many Gen Zs at all. All right, this is going to be quite important. So remember that. So let's talk about the first mega trend is about the Gen Z realty. So we're talking about Gen Z who is not well represented in this um, in this audience. So remember that we have a duty of care to be thinking about what they um, what they want um, and what they need. So who is this I generation? That's another nickname for them. So Gen Z, as mentioned um, on the previous slide, are born between 1996 and 2012. So they're generally around 90 to 25 years old. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking about kids, we're talking about teenagers, we're talking about young adults. So people that at the old, you know at the oldest end they're starting to enter the workforce and finish their studies, but a lot of them, you know, they're still kids. So the most important characteristic about them is to remember that they are digital natives. They are born into an age where they've never 
where they've always had the internet. They've never known a world without the internet. So for them, being able to do things in a digital manner is second nature. This is the world that they know. You know, compared to millennials, a lot of us are millennials um, on this call of all different ages. You know, for us old millennials, um, sometimes we call it ex ennials which I cannot pronounce in any other way because we kind of tether between Gen X and between millennials. For us millennials, a lot of us were actually born into an age and for the Gen Xs and beyond, we're born into an age where everything was analog. If we wanted to find information, we'd have to go to the library or go to an encyclopedia to get information. And we had to come along and start learning about the different technologies available and start adapting our way of working and interacting with the world because we knew how to live and do everything before, um, before the age of the internet. So we're quite adaptable. But for Gen Z, they're not. They're, um, you know, they're, they, they only know a world with the internet. The other thing that's quite important to know is that already they're the largest global population group. So there's a lot of them. And this is a generation that obviously they're gonna keep rising up the ranks in the workforce, but also we need to remember that there's a lot of them in numbers and we need to take them into consideration. So I'm gonna run through just a few of their characteristics um, just to set the scene. So firstly on average, they use five devices. So for a lot of us, we might be using our phone and computer, they're averaging five devices and often using them at the same time. They also average 10 hours a day on their devices. Now remember, these aren't office workers. These are kids that usually, you know, go to school and play with their friends and do other things, but they're spending 10, day, 10 hours a day on average on their devices. So they're always on. 71% plan to become homeowners. So, you know, they're actually, they're actually quite savvy about saving up their money and learning from the mistakes of the millennials that chose a lifestyle over settling down. And they plan to become homeowners. So if you're in that part of the market, uh, remember that this is a great target group for you to be thinking about. At the same time, by 2030, 75% of the workforce, along with millennials, is going to consist of Gen Z. So this is not even, this is less than a decade away. So when we're thinking about the way that we run our companies, this is the future of workforce. When we think about the way that we design and operate workspaces, especially when we're talking about this return to office, remember that in the next 10 years, 75% of your, um, your occupants are gonna be expecting a highly digitized experience. So while you're planning today for, you know, for tomorrow, think about 2030 and who the occupants are and what their requirements are. So I'm gonna run through a list of some characteristics of Gen Z, which is quite important to know. And then I'm gonna tie it back into the applications for real estate. So firstly, they view products as a service. So an example of a product as a, as a service is rather than owning a car, somebody might catch an Uber. So, you know, moving away from this ownership model. Um, they want brands to take a stand. So if you can remember the climate warriors, you know, they're thinking about global warming and they're thinking about, um, you know, what's gonna happen in their lifetime and affect their world. So they're very vocal on this. Um, they have unidentified identities. So, you know, gender fluidity is something that you hear a lot about, um, you know, from this generation, especially. They expect personalization. You know, they've come into a world where, you know, where the internet um, and, you know, social media and everything else can have their name on it and they're able to adapt it and hack it. And this is just part of their DNA and way of being. And also they're entrepreneurial. So um, I'm getting, go into this in a little bit more um, detail along the way as well, but you'll see that they're not actually looking to have nine to five jobs. They're looking for flexibility and for creating something that they can take ownership of. So in terms of a real estate application, you know, product have a, as a service, you know, you might have apps that help, um, you know, help a Gen Z or anybody else to book a space such as a workspace or to order lunch or whatever it might be. You know, expecting brands to take a stand, they might um, actually question you about what um, materials are being used in a building or about your modern slavery um, policy, if you're signing up to certain mandates as well. Um, unidentified identity, for example, might be gender neutral toilets, um, which was in the press quite a lot in recent years. Expecting personalization, you know, already you can customize Nike shoes online. Think about how somebody might want to be able to customize their own space and what that might look like and how you might deliver it. 
they're communicaholics. So remember, they're always on. They're hyper-connected. They're you know, using, you know, five devices, you know, 10 hours a day on average. So even just thinking about, you know, where can they charge and where can they recharge is quite important. And they're entrepreneurial. So, you know, this is this kid, Ryan Twold, who is a multi, was a multimillionaire, I believe, at the age of eight. So this is what we're aspiring to. So just a few stats behind it. 76% um, already earn money through part-time work. So remember, these are kids. 76% already earn money through part-time work. Some of them, for example, are reselling sneakers online, um, you know, or having other little side hustles because they can. You know, 41% plan to become entrepreneurs. They're not planning to, um, you know, to have desk jobs. They're not planning to be firemen. They're not planning to, to, to take a, what we would have seen as a very traditional path um, when we were growing up, but they plan to make something of themselves through their own means, which is quite interesting. And also 46% plan to invent something that would change the world. So, you know, being socially minded is just incredibly embedded into their DNA. And this is great. I, I think what defines Gen Z is just moving fast. We're not used to waiting around for stuff. Everything I want, I want everything to come quickly. So this is something that's quite interesting. You know, it's this notion of what's also been coined Instagrat, you know, you know um, adapted from Instagram, you know, instant gratification. They're not going to wait around for five or 10 years for something to happen. They want it to happen immediately. And through digital means, you can actually have that flexibility to deliver on it even if you can't deliver on it through the fixed infrastructure. So being able to play in this kind of like fast and slow lane between the fast digital and the slow physical is somewhere where you want to be to be able to respond to their needs. So just some considerations for uh, commercial real estate, you know, consider expanding places as a service, um, you know, have some personalized experiences. They can be digital or they can be physical. You know, you want to have responsible corporate governance. ESG is incredibly important to them and part of their DNA. Have an ethical supply chain, sustainable building materials. Think about the full life cycle. These are things that they're thinking about um, and things that they will be asking about. You know, optimize the last mile. You know, think about how you can actually have efficiencies when it comes to deliveries. And also reduce virtual to in real life friction points. You know, they come from this hybrid physical and digital world. And this is something we want to be more responsive to as time goes on. All right, so the next mega trend, talking about digital realty. And I think a lot of us would have seen some of these trends already emerging in recent times. So I like to remind us where we've been. You know, the personal computer really took off in the mid 90s. Before that, we had calculators, which took off in the 60s and 70s. Before that, you know, the, we, we didn't really have those options around. So, you know, technology's really changed and we've had to change with it. And this is in such a short period of time. So, you know, we've seen some headlines about the change that's been happening. You know, I said it's not a, um, a COVID talk. We're talking about post-COVID, but we've seen some significant trends that are happening, you know, with real estate transactions going virtual, being able to buy homes online, you know, being able to search online increasingly so. And what we've really seen is, you know, through the whole property buying process, we've seen a significant change that's come through. You know, that's really been touching every single um, point in, in the process, you know, for, um, you know, for residential, for commercial. And, you know, what it's created is a more efficient ecosystem, you know, with adoption at different points um, along the way. You know, some companies taking a full picture adoption um, and some just, you know, digitizing certain nodes to bring efficiencies. You know, running through some obvious examples, taking it from the home search, you know, it's very seldom that someone would actually go into a realtor's office and look at what's in the window. You know, people have been looking online for a very long time and it's become very efficient to do so. You know, increasing in prevalence recently has been virtual viewings where, you know, you might have your broker actually going into the space with their iPhone camera and doing a walkthrough tour. Well, you know, the the purchaser or the um, you know the tenants might be sitting at a third you know at a third location. Um, I don't think this was this was meant to be a. Might see maybe a workers video. No, it won't. 
Uh, I think some of us are familiar with Matterport and 3D um, videos that can also be of you know existing spaces or of um, or of soon to be built spaces um, with virtual reality to take virtual tours. That's been increasing in um, popularity. Um, even drones have been used for surveys. So being able to do remote surveys is something that's been really fantastic. Um, you know, being found to be even more accurate than traditional means um, and highly efficient to be able to get a survey of a you know, full building facade remotely or of a site um, to be able to get those levels. So that's something that's been really fantastic for the construction industry. And again, it's increasing in popularity. And of course, we can get a whole plethora of property data um, with the different types of representation, be it foot traffic and understanding you know, the time of day that people are coming through all the way through to heat maps and actually being able to track in a spatial sense where people are moving to again understand deficiencies. You know, for retail operations, obviously this is something quite interesting to understand. You know, do you have that footfall in certain areas that you expected? You know, blockchain and has allowed for trust um, and e-signatures has been increasing in um, popularity as well to be able to facilitate virtual contracts. And you know, I love this quote coming in from CBRE, just talking about the future workforce. You know, with data analysts, statisticians, programmers, accountants, and industry specialists already being um, embedded in the valuation world, that there is an expectation that you're going to have more, um, you know, more numbers people, more data people, more tech people embedded into the real estate industry. So moving on to the next mega trend, being around flexibility. You no, know, for most of us, we've become familiar over the past you know, year and a half, being able to work remote, sitting at home, schooling at home, working out at home. And really, the enabling technology around that has been cloud technology. Because what the cloud has done is that it's freed us up from needing to be in a fixed location. So previously, in terms of work, we know that you need to go into the office. There might be the server room there, the secure server room. There might be your filing cabinets, all the things that you need. And now with the cloud, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the physical office, if you're at home, at a cafe, it doesn't matter because as long as you can connect. So really what work has become in nowadays is it's become about having your device with you, you know, connecting into the cloud, which stores and receives information, and then connects to people wherever they are. And that's been the notion of freeing us up from space and also using non-traditional space to be able to do things such as working from a cafe or a park or a beach or whatever it might be. So it's actually been quite a, um, a foundational technology that's really impacting our industry, I think more so than any other technology. And that's why I've also coined the term the any place workplace because now we can work from anywhere. No, this um, trend of flexibility hasn't just impacted on office, it's impacted in terms of change of use. So if you look at the slide, you can see two identical apartments. Um, if you want to spot the difference, there's, they look the same because it's the same image. But the difference with one is, you know, one permits Airbnb. So you can think about what the value is to somebody that actually owns that space. So for example, if you're, um, you know, if you're running a multifamily property and you permit Airbnb, that can change the value of a space and of course make it more desirable to somebody that's purchasing or renting there. But it also means that what we've seen is homes have changed into hotels. And this is not a new trend, but one that's definitely been widely adopted. We've also seen cafes turned into offices and we're gonna to expect to see this even more. Um, an interesting one that I saw, and I apologize, I can't recall the name of, um, of the platform, but it was actually turning dining rooms into boardrooms. And what it, this platform actually permits people to rent out their apartments as workspaces and boardrooms. So again, turning a home into a workplace for third parties is something that's quite interesting. Um, you know, the White Hotel and Industrious um, in Brooklyn, they turned hotel rooms into private offices in around March, April of 2020. And of course, we're seeing some malls being converted into other uses such as um, schools, third party logistics centers, um, a whole plethora of functions in just, you know, rethinking the omni-channel and retail landscape. Now, we've also seen parking lots used for a plethora of different reasons, um, such as food courts. We're also seeing repurposing of parking spaces if there are, you know, above or below grades, sometimes into, um, you know, into farms, for example, hyperlocal farms. 
Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in, in this realm as well, which I think is incredibly fascinating. And of course, even just in the theme of flexibility, we're seeing even the most flexible becoming even more flexible. You know, they're actually describing flexibility as a competitive advantage, which is quite interesting. You know, over the past year, we saw WeWork, um, you know, already a flexible office provider, making their memberships even more flexible in offering global memberships. So a person's not tied to one location, they can use any location. You know, IKEA, that's always been incredibly smart and nimble. They're actually moved into furniture rentals, um, which, you know, which again is an exciting concept. Um, you know, we have other notions such as, you know, Notel moving into furniture subscriptions and just a lot of innovation and flexibility happening in this space. So moving into the next mega trend, um, let's talk about some bricks and clicks retail. So what's become quite interesting in the retail landscape is just the, um, the emergence and increasing prevalence of omni-channel. So what we have is that when it comes to buying habits, it's a mixture between online and in-store behavior. So on one hand, you might have people coming into the store to, you know, to see what's, you know, what's available, to try on some clothes, to see it in the flesh, um, to actually feel it, and then going home to buy it. But alternatively, you might also have somebody doing their research online and then going into the store to experience it. So there's this meshing together of the digital and physical space that we want to be able to respond to as a real estate industry to facilitate um, this type of interaction. You know, warehouses and you know, third party logistics has just become incredibly hot as people are you know, expecting this on-demand economy, as people are um, becoming more comfortable with e-commerce, as the whole supply chain is changing. You know, we're seeing an uptick in warehouses, which is expected to continue. And they are also becoming increasingly sophisticated with robotics and a whole, you know, a whole range of technology that's coming through. So what used to be quite a dormant and stationary asset class has actually become one of the most interesting areas of late and expected to be so even more so into the future. You know, delivery, however, is still a mess. Um, you know, just thinking about how, you know, parking happens outside spaces, that's something still waiting for some innovation. You know, parcels can be received through parcel lockers. Um, you know, Target had a play. Um, they actually, you know, they created some drive up order pickup zones. They had a 1000% um, uptick in the past year, whereas in 2017, they tried this and it failed. So also thinking about timing and timeliness of initiatives. You know, Woolworths in Australia, they kind of, you know, it's a supermarket. They've gone through, you know, through every single iteration, whether you can pick it up through a drive through lane where there's fridges, have somebody drop it off in the boot of your car, or um, having, you know, parcel lockers outside, whatever it is, they're experimenting. And I think this notion of experimentation is something that is just so important to do. You know, Amazon, again, you know, so many options, whether you pick up in store, have it delivered or parcel locker, this whole notion of um, parcel collections become quite interesting. You know, their stores, they've been experimenting with cashierless checkouts. Um, I definitely enjoy going to them. I time myself going in to get my salad and out. I think I'm 90 seconds is my best time. And they're actually, um, with this technology, they've made it available to other operators to be able to use. So we expect an expansion. You no know, deliveries can happen by drones. You know, Amazon's also experimented with deliveries by robots. And this is something I'll go into a little bit more detail in this section, which I like to call drones, drones, and iPhones. So firstly, when we talk about robots, what's a robot? A machine resembling a human that replicates certain human movements and functionality automatically. Well, that definition is actually considered quite out of date. And the new definition really is a machine designed to execute tasks automatically suited to tasks that are repetitive, dull, or dangerous. So especially um, those of you in construction, you can think of many repetitive, dull, or dangerous tasks. Those are ones that are probably well suited, especially dangerous um, to robots taking over rather than humans um, with human operators involved. So whenever we talk about robots, people wonder about, will robots take my job? Someone's already gone through and actually built a website around it. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, chief executives, how, how safe is your job? 
they've done the math, only 1.5% chance that your job will be taken away from you. So don't you worry, you're, um, you're in good stead. In terms of jobs, you know, this has always been a question. Um, you know, will technology take jobs? No, there's actually a lot of research around this. I've just pulled out one article from The Guardian, which says that technology has created more jobs than it has destroyed since 140 years of data. And what we actually see, and this has been described time and time again, is that the nature and type of jobs tends to change. So you're moving away from, you know, the dull and dangerous jobs, um, more towards knowledge workers. So this is definitely a journey that you want to take, you know, um, your your team along with you, rather than rather than being robot phobic to understand the opportunities of robots. So in terms of some trends in the robotics world, um, you know, what we see at the at the lower end is, um, you know, some, you know, some pros robotic process automation. So rather than you having to do something repetitively, what we like to see is that robots come in and make our lives easier, getting rid of those dull, repetitive and dangerous tasks. So we've all interacted with, uh, with chatbots so they can have very simple functionality, such as being able to um, you know, schedule a meeting or track a, um, you know, a, support, um, or a support request or answer very simple questions. So you know, that can take away a lot of you know, the, um, the, you know, the dull and repetitive work. You know, the scramble to get uh, delivery robots is something that's quite real. You know, a lot of different companies have been experimenting with um, and testing out delivery robots. So these have been ha around for about coming up to a decade almost, you know, particularly for campus settings. Um, there's a lot of different companies making a play in this, you know, for delivering small parcels, you know, short distances such as, you know, meal delivery um, and parcel delivery. So um, this is something to think about. You no, know, even in terms of the way that they're deployed, um, this is, a, you know, there's all various ways, you know, this is a van that actually picks up these little robots and then they get parked somewhere. So again, when we're thinking about loading, unloading, you know, where might this happen? This is something that's um, quite interesting. You no, know, we've already been in, um, we've all already been using a lot of apps for a lot of us, um, you know, controlling things at home from lighting, you know, getting um, access to different parts of your work. So this is going to increase. And also what we're going to see increase is the prevalence of using voice um, to control things, which obviously will start opening up the um, accessibility for people that are less able, but also the elderly and children to start controlling devices. So that gets quite fun as well. There's all plethora of home helpers. Um, you know, this one itself is a dancing robot. Um, Amazon also recently, I think it was just this week, they delivered a new home helper, um, which, you know, which has been coined a spying robot. So that's one worth um, looking into and maybe have the same opinion. They maybe think would be a bit more helpful. But you also see these home helpers, you know, from Amazon Alexa, Google Home, you know, Apple, you know, Apple's home kit, you know, Darwin. You see a lot of different home helpers that are around um, for us to have in our spaces. We have active robots such as Roombas, you know, um, and also, um, you know, other home appliances that can, you know, make meals for us. Autonomous cars we see are coming, um, expected to be in Australia by 2025. You know, uh, different numbers around. Um, autonomous trucks we know are being tested, you know, all through the US. You know, again, for thinking about how this is, affects your, um, your real estate and spaces is something very important to be thinking about also thinking about um, how autonomous trucks can be used in construction is another is another way to be thinking about things um, they've been increasing in prevalence in mining um, which has a lot of advantages and also just thinking about with autonomous cars thinking about what that means in terms of spatial design we need less parking more pickup zones and we also need to be able to service them there's also a plethora of um, flying flying devices and you know different types of drones and um, you know unmanned um, unmanned flights. The first applications are believed to be um, drone taxis going from you know from A to B, probably from airports to cities, as an example. And Hyundai believes that they'll be in operation by 2030. They've definitely been tested, and um, there's already skyports being built all around the world. That's the concept, for example, from Uber Elevate. Um, 
which is quite beautiful. Even Frank Lloyd Wright was thinking about it. Um, you know, the, you know, imagining this is a time before computers even existed. He had a sense that flying cars would be coming to our cities. This is an image from a working group from NASA from last year. Um, this is quite, um, you know, this is quite important because this is a series of um, workshops that they've been running. I mean, you know, about one a month. And you can see all these different applications of drones that they see coming from, you know, from cargo delivery to medical transfer to package delivery and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing that I like to just point out, which seems a bit obvious, but I like to point it out anyway, is that you can see for all of these flights that they have to move from node to node, which means that they're moving from real estate to real estate. So thinking about how your, how your assets are actually thinking about the role that drones are going to be playing in the future, I think is quite interesting. Um, in terms of delivery, we already have um, Wing, which is an Alphabet company, Alphabet being the parent company of Google. They've already been delivering coffees, which is fantastic. And of course, you know, Amazon's been playing um, in the drone space. And a lot of the big providers such as UPS, um, you know, Google, Amazon, Alphabet, they've been all looking at, you know, FedEx. They've all been looking at uh, drone delivery solutions. And this has been happening for a long time. Um, first starting off with rural and suburban areas, um, and then it will move into more, um, more urban areas, which is a little bit more difficult to navigate. But these are technologies that have been around for a long time. So just to think about the real estate um, applications that support this is quite interesting. As I mentioned, drone surveys, you know, another fantastic use for drones. But at the end of the day, we also need to remember that while we're thinking about robots and interacting with robots, that we're actually designing for people and our places are for people, but we're gonna start interacting with robots more and more. So I'm gonna flick over um, to another poll question before we move into the final part of this presentation. Thank you, Nikki. And for our third of four polling questions, do you think you will see flying taxis in your lifetime? Again, remember to click on your selection here on the slide and hit the submit button. Once you have completed all CPE requirements, which is answering three of the four questions here on the session, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. I'll revisit this point at the end of the session and we'll give it a couple more seconds there we go. Let's take a look at the results. Nikki, back over to you. There we go. Almost split, leaning towards yes. Very interesting. So this is a little bit of fun just to close out the presentation. And I like to remember, remind everyone that if you can imagine it, you can create it. And we don't know all the answers at the moment, but we get to create the future that we want to see. So some of you will remember the cartoon, The Jetsons. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, The Jetsons is a cartoon created by Hanna-Barbera. It were, actually came out in 1968 and it imagined a nuclear family in 2068. So not all that far into the future for us now. And at the time, um, you know, it was considered to be the most futuristic, um, you know, cartoon of its type. It actually went off air because not many people had color television, so they didn't get to enjoy the full experience. So even in terms of how it was made, it was ahead of its time. So I'm going to run through um, some of the ideas that they had, that these creative cartoonists had, and let's see if any of them came to life. So let's run through these quite quickly. So this was the style of the school, you know, looking very futuristic. This is actually LAX in a style called Googie architecture. So also a very futuristic style. So that exists. Here's the husband going to work, putting his feet up on the desk. But actually our no nature of work has changed. Uh, you don't even need to go into work. You actually work off the cloud. You know, working out in front of the TV. Of course we have mirror, which um, some of you may be familiar with. No, having your TV on your on uh, as a watch, and of course today we have smart watches that do so much more than just viewing. No, having an encyclopedia in the palm of your hand. Of course today we have the internet and you no know, Wikipedia and and all the rest of the knowledge. No, having a robot made. Of course today we have Roomba and other robot vacuum cleaners. No, having having a uh, robot dog. And today there's a plethora of robot dogs anywhere from, you know, $18 all the way through to $9,000. So you know, they've, they've come to be. So 
in summary, as we close out, you know, firstly, you want to be Gen Z ready, have a tech first mentality. Remember, they're already the first, the um, largest global population group. And by 2030, they're going to be 75% of the workforce. So definitely you don't want to ignore this group. Secondly, the digital and physical must complement. We're living in an age where they're of, they're of equal importance and we wanna have physical spaces that support digital activities happening within them. And in terms of our robot future, put robots to work, don't be scared of them. You know, find those, you know, those dull, dangerous and repetitive tasks that they can do and free up your own personal time. So as a final thought, as we close out, no, we cannot predict the future, but we can create it. So we have one more poll question, and then we'll go to Q&A. Thank you. And for our final polling question, which megatrend did you find most interesting? Go ahead and pick from one of the answers here, lock it in with the submit button, and we'll be advancing as soon as we get more responses in. This is our fourth and final polling question for the day before we move to Q&A. All right, the percentage completed has increased. Let's lock in a couple more answers, a couple more seconds here. And great, let's take a look at the results. All right, here are the results for the final polling question of the day. And let's turn things over to Q&A. All right, thank you. You know, after that result of, you know, the, the drones and um, the delivery via drones, there is a polling question related to that. So maybe I'll jump into that one first, Nikki. And the question is, do you think the FAA will be able to move quickly to allow the expansion of drone use? No. <laughs> no There's chance, a tough one. No chance. <laughs> it's, it's so difficult. I mean, you just have to look at that diagram and just seeing how there's all these like overlapping flight paths, there's security concerned, there's a lot of unknowns. As, you know, this is the biggest barrier to adoption is just being able to coordinate all of this. So it's happening. I mean, every city around the world has the same, um, you know, has the same difficulty. It's that you're opening up air rights to third parties and how do you control it? You know, I think we've all seen in science fiction movies how you have, you know, flying cars and then, you know, all these like different things crossing and these crazy motorways and what happens when something crashes. So it's, it's gonna be very difficult for them to figure out. It's not gonna happen, um, it's not gonna happen in an instant. I think it's gonna be another one of these examples where it's a matter of the, um, the technology being ahead of the regulation. But at the same time, there's a lot of very smart people that have been thinking about this and working on this for a long time. And that's also why a lot of the, um, the testing and um, adoption is coming through more in suburban and rural areas where there's um, fewer complexities, um, as well as in some um, some you know places around the world where they are already very um, you know tech savvy and smart city. So it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while, and um, I wonder if that's maybe why some people responded to the poll question of not expecting to see flying taxis in their lifetime. But I'll be honest, I'm an optimist. I think there'll be flying taxis in our lifetime. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, another question um, is, I'm the CFO of a landscape architecture company and have been business manager for architectural firms. We're all wondering what the future of collaborative work looks like post-COVID, from office space arrangements to collaboration technologies. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and one that a lot of people have been wondering about um, and asking about and look I'm I mean this is probably not the response that you want to hear but I think it comes down to the company and it comes down to their culture and their way of working um, there are great collaboration tools that you can do things virtually um, being able to have a group discussion virtually especially with you know side conversations that doesn't always work so well in my experience now, I'm definitely a believer, you know, personally from my experience, 
you know, when I'm creating, I like to be in the same room as people and be able to you know, quite literally draw. But I think, you know, probably you know, post COVID, um, there's been a lot of talk about people being able to have flexible work arrangements and then come into a shared workspace, whether it's an actual office or it's just a, you know, renting a boardroom by the hour type situation, you know, and meeting in person to be able to collaborate, which is difficult to do online. So I think it comes down to the company and ways of working. Um, but at the same time, what I'd be encouraging you to do is that even if your way of working is very in person, start experimenting and trying out some of the virtual tools because there are efficiencies in it. And especially with things moving more towards being um, technology enabled, at least if you have a familiarity and an understanding of what's out there, you can be more adaptable. You know, it's like being able to work on like a PC or Mac. It's like whatever's in front of you, you'll be ready to, um, you know, take up the challenge, even if you have a preference. Um, so, yeah, that's that's um, that's basically my opinion on all of this. All right. Thank you. What do you think are the biggest differences between the millennials and Gen Z related to the workforce? Ah, that's that's an interesting one. Um, I think generally when it comes to the workforce, millennials have had a bad rap and millennials have been seen and criticized as being lifestyle oriented um, rather than work oriented and also of wanting to be the boss on day one rather than you know, actually, um, you know, spending the time in a company and, and going up the ranks. You know, mill millennials are quite transitory. Um, there's um, some statistics around it. I believe that the average millennial starts looking for a new job within 12 months of being at a job and actually typically moves after 18 months. And what I think is the biggest difference between Gen Z, um, you know, we've described a lot of their characteristics already, and millennials is that, you know, for um, you know, for those that run companies, if you think that millennials are difficult, I think the Gen Zs are going to be even more difficult compared to traditional work culture. You know, a big part of this and a big part of this, you know, transitory nature for millennials themselves, which I expect we're going to see a lot of for, um, you know, for Gen Zs, is that. You know, number one with technology, it doesn't need to be the nine to five. Anyone can have a side hustle. And there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, influencers and a lot of, um, you know, online superstars and entrepreneurs that have been able to have huge success through the online world. So this, you know, these become the role models that, you know, it's perceived that there doesn't necessarily have to be, somebody doesn't have to hold on to a nine to five job, that they can actually be entrepreneurial and make their own path and be very successful at it. So it's going to be um, hard to hold on to these Gen Zs, you know, so that's one dimension. And another dimension is just remembering that information is now super accessible. So whereas in the past, there needed to be an apprenticeship to actually take your time and learn a function, Gen Zs can go onto YouTube and learn something instantaneously, and that's the world that they've grown up in. So um, similar, but slightly different. Um, but um, I think we should all be inspired by what the Gen Zs are doing. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I think I, I do know we have a couple uh, questions that are left, but I believe we've run out of time. So we'll make sure that we get these questions answered. Nikki, I so want to thank you for your time today. This was absolutely fascinating and really appreciate your insight. And I'm going to turn it back over to Gerald. Thank you for having me. It's been a delight. Thank you, Nikki, for a great presentation today and to you as well, Elaine, for moderating. I also want to thank the audience for being engaged and for submitting questions to help guide today's conversation. If we didn't have time to answer your question, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Also, please feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have any additional queries. If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available now to download in the CPE progress window. I will keep this webcast console, this session open for a few minutes to give you time to navigate to it and to download the file. 
Should you have any difficulties locating or downloading that file now, a copy will be emailed to you within three weeks. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. Finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining our webcast, everyone. We hope you'll join us again for the next session in our Building Opportunity Conference webcast series. Take care.